What we focus on filters the world around us so aggressively that it limits what we see. Does that make sense to everybody? Medical science says if we stop drinking, stop smoking, reduce our caloric intake and start exercising, we can actually add two years to our life expectancy. I say, who cares? <laughs> it's just two. <laughs> That's who you are, that's who we are, that's who America is. When we fall down, we get back up. Ladies and gentlemen, it's called perceptual blindness. We miss the stuff that is hiding in plain sight. Gentlemen, let me speak to you for just a second. Have you ever had the refrigerator door open Honey, have you seen the ketchup? <laughs> and it's right there. It's right there. And your wife comes and she, and she grabs it and she hands it to you. And as she's walking off, she mutters under her breath, moron, right? right? <laughs> it's called perceptual blindness. We miss the stuff that's hiding in plain sight. We have seen these periods before is called the evolution of a revolution. When I'm talking about a revolution, I'm not talking about what's going on in the Middle East. I'm talking about the Industrial Revolution, the Railroad Revolution, electrification, mass production, information technology. We have seen these periods before, and what I'm going to do now for the next 10 minutes is I'm going to explain how a revolution unfolds. There are eight steps to a revolution, and they always unfold the exact same way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain how this happens, then I'm going to give you two examples. Then I'm going to show you two slides. And when I show you these two slides, everything will make logical sense to you, and you will be as optimistic about the future as I am today. In 1880, the city of New York had a huge problem. Someone tell me what the problem was in New York in 1880. Horse poop. Your average horse weighs 1,300 pounds, and they will displace between 25 and 35 pounds of manure every single day. In 1898, the world had its very first international urban planning conference. London, Paris, Chicago, New York, we all had this problem. How are we going to fix the problem? So people from all over the world gathered together to find a solution to the problem. It was a 10-day symposium. After three days, they, they disbanded. They, they went home. They said, we can't find a solution. The only solution is you got to get rid of the horses. Can't get rid of the horses. That's our main means of transportation. There was an economist at this meeting, and he did the math, and he said, if the problem continues to grow at the rate that it has been growing, by the year 1920, the city of New York will be buried 30 feet deep in horse manure. What are we going to do with it? Send it to New Jersey. <laughs> and they did. This is good. This is good. In 1913, Henry Ford said, the biggest problem with my customers is they can only extrapolate the present. They can't see into the future. He said, if I asked my customers, what do you expect from Ford Motor Company? They would have said a faster horse. They didn't understand that the automobile was gonna be a better means of transportation. By 1915, automobiles outnumbered horses. By 1917, they retired the last horse. Necessity is the mother of invention. Does this make sense to everybody? We tend to extrapolate the present. Could that be true today about the economy? Americans believe that America's best days are behind us. Now, here are the two slides I promised. All right. These are the dates of the revolutions. And what you'll notice is they last between 45 and 60 years start to finish. And the microprocessor was invented in 1971, 44 years ago. Idea, exotic curiosity, early adoption, general acceptance, frenzy, collapse, final buildup. Okay, let's put this in picture form. There's the Industrial Revolution, there's the Railroad Revolution, 
there is electrification, there is mass production, there is information technology. When one revolution ends, another one quickly begins. When one revolution ends, another one quickly begins. Ladies and gentlemen, we're just nearing the end of this revolution. There's going to be another revolution. And the next revolution becomes the next engine of growth and you start the whole process all over again. Remember in 1899, reportedly, we don't know if it's true or not, but reportedly, Dr. Charles Duell, who was head of the U.S. Patent Office, wanted to close the patent office. He said everything that can be invented has been invented. <laughs> 1899. I want to put that in perspective for you. Toilet paper was invented in 1910. There's going to be another revolution, and the next revolution becomes the next engine of growth. And I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. What's the next revolution? What's the next revolution? Tell me what the next revolution is, right? I don't know. I don't know. I got some good ideas. Is it biotech? Do we cure disease that has plagued society for hundreds of years? Is it something called graphene? Huh? I'm about to make your head explode. Graphene was discovered in 2004. The gentleman who discovered it won a Nobel Prize in 2010. Um, this, is, this is amazing stuff. 200 times stronger than steel. Flexible, bendable. You ready for this? Seven times lighter than air. It is super insulative. What you're looking at is a blowtorch, piece of graphene, and crayons on top of it. And what you'll notice is the crayons are not melting. It is 10,000 times faster than silicone. It creates electricity. <clears throat> One more time. You mean it conducts electricity. No, 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 no. It does conduct electricity. It's super conductive. But it creates electricity. And you know how it creates electricity? If you pour salt water on graphene, it creates electricity. Elon Musk, the rumor is experimenting with graphene car batteries that recharge in four to five minutes lightweight. Now, is this a revolution? So let's bring this thing to a close. What happens next to an America? You all remember Kerry Strug? 1996 Summer Olympics, the women's magnificent seven. It was seven girls, 1996, Atlanta, Georgia. They had never won a gold medal in a fully attended Olympics. 96, it was going to be our year. Dominic Dawes, Shannon Miller, Amy Chow, Dominic Mochiano, Carrie Strug, J.C. Phelps. Carrie, she barely made the team. Now, why? She had broken her back the year before. Seven girls, four exercises, you get one shot at every exercise except the last one, the vault. For some reason, you get two shots at the vault. I don't know why it is what it is. <laughs> We're going into our last exercise. America's got the gold. Russia's got the silver. Shannon Miller leads us off. She stands back. She runs down the runway, she hits the springboard, she does a somersault, and she nails it. America's got the gold. We work our way down to girl number six, Dominique Mochiano. This is her event. She can do it in her sleep. She said, I've done it a thousand times before. She stands back, she runs down the runway, she hits the springboard, she does a somersault, and she falls to the ground. It's okay, she gets a second shot. She stands back in line. She runs down the runway. She hits the springboard. She does a somersault. And she falls again. In an interview, she said, it felt like someone had greased the mat. And America went from gold to silver. We have one more shot. We have Carrie Strug. Broke her back the year before. She stands back. She runs down the runway. She hits the springboard. She does a somersault. And she falls to the ground. Y'all remember this? And breaks her ankle. 
tears two ligaments, stands up, can't put any weight on it. Collectively, 30,000 people in the gym go, oh man, we lost again. Now she needs to score, she needs to score, she did the score a 9.41 to bring home the gold. And I don't know if you remember this, but a 9.4 is a perfect score. So she needs to do just a little bit better than perfect. 30,000 people go, oh, lost again. And then you hear her, her coach, Bella Crowley, shake it out, Carrie. Shake it out, right? <laughs> you see her trying to shake it out. You can't shake it out. <laughs> it's broken. You can do it, Carrie. Remember this? You can do it, Carrie. She gets back in line. The, oh my gosh, she's going to try, the commentator, she's going to try this again. Oh no, no, she can do a permanent damage. No, she's going to try this again. Ladies and gentlemen, no one would have blamed her if she would have turned back. But no one would have remembered her either. She stands back in line. She's got a broken ankle and two torn ligaments. She runs down the runway. She hits the spring where she does a somersault and she nails it, right? Look at the look on her face. She pulled that leg up so she can get scored. And then she drops to the ground and she's pulling herself off the mat. She's waving Bella Crowley off. Finally, Bella Crowley comes and he picks his little bird, his, he and his wife. And she's crying, he's crying. Score comes up. Nine, seven. And she won, and the Americans won, and they pan the audience, and everybody's crying. I cry when I watch the darn thing. <laughs> Why do we cry when we watch that? Because that day, you didn't see something good. That day, you didn't see something great. That day, you saw something outstanding. And that's who you are, that's who we are, that's who America is. When we fall down, we get back up, even if we are knee deep in horse manure. Thank you all very much. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much. making me cry. But anyway, thank you so much, Mark. That was incredible.